Welcome to Salon to Art. It is, what is it? It's July 17th. I am not really sure that it is already July now, but it is of the year 2020. Yay. Um, I'm so thrilled to see all your familiar faces and some new ones too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And today we will, uh, Danielle and I actually are going to be discussing uh, Kahindi Wildy, Wildy. Wild. 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 Hey, Wild. you're supposed to be on mute. Um, <laughs> Wildly. And, um, and his work and his um, influences, and also uh, a little more um, in-depth into his, uh, his stylistic work, which is, is, which for both of us is, we, are, is impressive, beautiful, and um, influential, um, and pertinent to current issues. So um, what we're gonna be doing is we'll have a slideshow um, where Danielle and I will discuss for the first about half an hour or so, we're trying to make it short, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards, and, uh, and we will see what we can make of our conversation, right? So, okay. All right, so once again, um, remember that this is thanks to Art Center Sarasota. We are happy to be doing this, but um, you, we ask that if you do um, enjoy our presentation, that you do donate to the Art Center. Um, every little bit helps. And we will continue doing this. I know, Joyce, I do this every single time and you guys all laugh at me. Um, and <laughs> I've got my spiel down. Um, so thank you for supporting Art Center Sarasota and uh, away we go. Are you ready? Okay, I'm gonna share screen. <laughs> Oops, all oh, that worked too. All right, everyone can see it? Thumbs up? Good, all right. Okay, um, as Elizabeth said, I'm Danielle Digert. I work for Art Center Sarasota, but I'm also an artist. Um, and this is an individual who's influenced my work pretty directly, but also um, the philosophy is, of his work and um, conceptually why he's creating what he's creating is really um, the big influence for myself. So Kehinde Wiley is an American portrait painter based in New York City, who is known for his highly naturalistic paintings um, of young black men and women rendered in a photorealistic style against a densely painted background. I'm not spotlighting her. Okay, so we're going to go through just a little bit of his life and his history uh, before we start with his work. So he was born in February of 1977 in Los Angeles, California, uh, central LA, actually. He is born a twin to an African, Amer Amer or sorry, an African American mother and a Nigerian father. The name Kahindi means second born twin in Yoruba. Yoruba, sorry. Uh, Wiley's mother, while raising six children, sent him at 12 years old to a six-week art program in what is now St. Petersburg, Russia. So he was able to look at the works, um, the masterworks at the Hermitage. He loved the frescoes of the uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th century and was really introduced to the idea that this monumental work was still at the forefront of museum culture in the 20th century. Yeah, the funny thing was, it's like, the Hermitage, right? He was born in 1977, when I was born. Yeah. yeah. I would have loved to have been, what was I doing at 12 years old? I'm not sure. Right. But the Hermitage, mm -hmm. what an opportunity. Yeah, so it was a really uh, kind of influential mood that his mother, of course, encouraged and credits her with that um, completely. But his affinity towards art led to this, uh, this decision to go and study abroad. Um, and then he came back to the U.S., but fast forward to age 20. Wiley, 
Oh, oh good. Guys, so if you're oh, talking, if you can put your step. mics, please. Together. Okay. Um, you're welcome. Anytime. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So fast forward to the age of 20, and Wiley goes to Nigeria to actually meet his father for the first time and explore his uh, roots. So before he was born, his father had returned to Nigeria, so he grew up without that male uh, father figure and was raised by his mother. So of course she presented that strong female um, maternal influence for him. Uh, and he's also got his brother, twin brother. Twin brother, yeah. yeah. And siblings, and various siblings. Yeah. So after kind of exploring his roots um, in uh, Nigeria, he returned to the U.S. to get a uh, BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, followed by an MFA from the Yale School of Art in 1999. And this was when Yale still is, but this is when Yale was top-notch painting school, renowned uh, for producing some of the most influential contemporary painters. Um, so while he was at school, this is just one example of the work from there, uh, he was focused on how to create a contemporary portrait and what a contemporary portrait meant, what it meant to represent himself authentically. And his quote about this work is, how do we go beyond media stereotypes about national identity and identity in general? I don't really think of myself as a young gay black American nor do I interface with my Brazilian or Mexican or Jewish friends in that way. But this work is um, conspicuous fraud series. So it's this idea of um, kind of remaining authentic, but also literally presenting that well, and, yeah, and I mean, opening that up. He's, he's dressed in, in a, I don't, can't, well, it's a two-piece suit at least, but I mean, that's very, you know, Yale-esque, I would think, stereotypical dress. Um, but then, you know, he's, and he's clean cut, all that kind of stuff. And then he has this hair that, that just emerges and becomes the motifs that we then later see mm -hmm. in his work, which I, I think that's a, an interesting, um, you know, kind of transition mm -hmm. to go from, you know, the, 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 the embodiment of the, of the hair and afro and that kind of stuff that that the power that that he feels akin to with that and his the maleness and then he goes switches it over into almost you know decorative floral motifs, um, motifs akin mm -hmm. to like william morris or something in mm -hmm. the arts and crafts movement is is really in coco is interesting yeah you know but but this work, he's talking about what a contemporary portrait means, but still trying to understand his place in a country, his place in a city, his place in time, and is referring back to some of this fraud aspect of the way that we present ourselves with the color of this background. The color here is mm -hmm. from the Martha Stewart collection. It was the color of the year in 2001. So that blue kind of, it's actually a seafoam green tone. You can't quite tell in this image, um, but playing with this presentation of an authentic portrait on top of something as commercial as Martha Stewart's color line. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. commercialism. So that work led to um, an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And this is just a short video. We've got a couple of these in here talking about his experience in New York and when he moved there from California. When moving to New York, I found this picture, this mugshot study in the streets. It was actually a piece of paper blowing in the streets and I picked it up. Surprisingly, it had this portrait of an individual whose face seemed incredibly young and sympathetic. I thought immediately it would be a perfect candidate for a portrait. But then I started looking even more closely. There were jewels that seemed culturally specific. There were infractions that said exactly what he had done, his social security number, where he lived. All of these markings that said something about him, very specifically a place and time. But it also said so much about what portraiture is, the reveal, the choice to reveal, what do you reveal, and who gets to do it. In this particular type of portraiture, though, it was in full display, frontal, side. It was the catalyst for new thinking about portraiture and its possibilities. Great. And um, he, he was really 
he talks about it here, influenced by the artist Barclay Hendricks, who was an American painter at the turn of the 20th century, um, who's best known for depicting the depicting Black American culture. And Kahindi explains this way better than I could. Um, but this is this starts the discussion about um, the kind of urban depiction of self and this less uh, posed version of a, of, of a portrait and what that means. Yeah, and both of these videos were, uh, were produced by the uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Art, which um, when they were doing a, I'm not sure if it was like retrospective, it wouldn't be retrospective at this point, but kind of like, you know, how the world relates to him mm -hmm. candy at this point in time. But it was nice to, um, to have this as a, a really great reference because you know short bits. Mm -hmm. Oh, oops. Sorry guys. Yeah. Any consideration of my work has to take into mind the work of Barclay Hendricks. He is absolutely foundational in terms of my understanding of how can you make the history of painting relevant today? What I love about his work is you can feel the moment. You're in that room at that moment. I, I, I love the decay that happens with the fashion, the bell bottoms, the dress code is absolutely of a place and of a time. What Barclay has done is he created a very sort of informal vocabulary for the portrait. The idea that formality drives a kind of stiff self-presentation is a very European, traditional, and classical way of painting. And Barclay did away with that. What he presented was this radical notion that freedom and clarity are uh, uh, perhaps the essence of Black American culture, a type of self-invention, a type of uh, spontaneity is, uh, at its best, the bloodline that flows through every one of his paintings. Barclay Hendricks also created this amazing double portrait. And I love doubling in painting. It's a big part of what I do. As a twin, I've been obsessed with this notion of the dual presentation of the subject. That repetition of the two girls, the repetition of two women in painting, you'll see in this exhibition. And I think it draws a very strong correlation to the Barclay Hendricks tableau. So what I want you to focus on from that video at the moment was that idea of um, kind of pairing back the uh, the posed figure and and looking at the figure in its in its natural state, uh, you know, in public in a, in a public space, how it lives every single day. Um, so we're going to go ahead and talk about just two elements of design that Hindi employs in all of his work. This is a of course a photo of him painting in New York. In his New York studio. This one came a little after um, a couple of bodies of work. He has an incredible plethora of series of works and we're only covering two, maybe three in this presentation. So yeah. keep that in mind as we go. But reason why, one of the reasons for showing the artist in his studio is one, we wanted to give you an idea of the scale of his work and also that he does work from photographs. Um, and he does talk about that in many of the videos that we um, peruse, that the models, uh, it's, you, you really can't get a figure model to sit anymore. <laughs> so, um, you know, and we'll find out a little more why. Yeah. yeah. So the first element that I'd like to talk about is composition. Okay, and so when you look at these historical works, master works, even contemporary portraiture, um, the composition is really integral to how that individual is presented within the space of the painting. So here, it's a self-contained composition where your eye flows from figure to the left, to the figure to the right, to the central figure, and back and back and back again. So you don't leave the frame of this artwork. And then the tripled figure multiplies the presence of the one man and gives power to the same profile positions as that mugshot found before when he was doing a studio residency. So kind of re-translating the idea, the way that these young black men were being um, displayed in those mugshots and, and how he can reinterpret that to give it power, give it presence, have a historical reference, 
and create a contemporary conversation yeah is what we're looking at here yeah it's um it's really the the key and kind of the essence is about um transformation and translation so as we go through these images think about those two buzzwords um and also this triangle um motif goes back far even farther back to the traditional like renaissance paintings where we see you know the the Virgin Mary and holding baby Jesus. It's always that triangle piece. Again, even with Charles, um, Charles, Charles I painting here um, and a number of other paintings from this period, um, they have each a different view. So this would be the different view of the king. So, well, the king is always watching you and he's always there for you. He's always important and powerful and crazy and like that. Yes. But, in relation back to Kahindi's work, the, um, the painting is of, he goes and finds his models uh, from the, he just goes down into the streets in New York and walks around and talks to people who he had, who the, he calls it like um, peacocking. Is that what yes. you could? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's like, so they have, they have presence to begin with. Um, and he goes up and he just asks him, he's like, hey, would you be interested in modeling? And um, at first, when people really didn't know who he was, they, there was a lot of um, really um, leave me alone type of thing, because, well, it's kind of weird, someone asking you to model for them. Um, but he did get a lot of, he still did get a lot of uh, people to come model. And so he would have them model and they would choose their outfits. So this a uh, young man chose that shiny uh, parka along with the painting because they would look through historical uh, photographs in the hit like the all different art history books and he they'd find one that they liked and then they'd come back for the sitting for the photo sitting and then the painting began and it's like it's kind of an interesting um, process and circle that he's created mm -hmm. again cyclical so. yes yeah. Okay, so the second element of design is the idea of divine light within the portrait. So I call this halo lighting, um, where there's light coming from every direction, which is cast on the figure in this way that makes the figure appear both weightless and radiant. So at the moment, we don't understand whether the light is coming from the, the sitter, the model, or if it's being applied to. And that harkens back to, of course, religious painting, iconography, the Rembrandt kind of style of lighting too. So light becomes a really um, clear discussion with this historical reference of how to create a good portrait, how to create a powerful painting, how to, how to represent the figure in that way. Yeah. And I also just wanna mention that he's using a pink light here. So he's not using an incandescent light, not even an LED. He's experimenting with some of the technological advances that we have in the 21st century and exploring those to create a conversation with contemporary painters. Yes. So it's not just the historical reference. He's also talking about the way that light affects skin tone and the way that light, you know, this is a pink light and he talks a lot about masculinity, being a man himself without that father figure too. So playing with the way in which contemporary artists can also experiment with light mm -hmm. rather than just these historical references. And to also go into this one, you can look at the, um, the background too, where the fate, because the background is so, is pretty static, it's still a, a rep repetitious pattern, but that figure almost three-dimensionally pops out, out mm -hmm. of the, the background because it is so flat versus the heavy pattern of his jacket or the you know the gold um weight of of the crucifix that he's wearing mm -hmm. um and you know that goes back to the references that he would have had from the hermitage and this is a portrait of uh of leopold prince of uh sex coburg um and you know the background it may be just a very basic landscape but the focus is that that figure that almost kind of pops out. And I, I think these ones would have been used as kind of like, you know, especially with royalty, is here, this is the prince, you want to marry him or, you know, mm -hmm. you want to show him off, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
And we specifically pulled this portrait of Leopold because it's from the Hermitage Museum collection. Yes. So at 12 years old, studying abroad, this is the sort of portrait that Kahindi would see. Um, both the radiant light, the composition, and then also it being a yeah. historic white male um, depicted in, in this work. So he talks a lot about being so young and not being represented in the works that he loved, because he still loves the work. Mm -hmm. um, he just wants to see himself or people who look like him also represented in this way. And I think that is, um, is actually, you know, that's probably the third strong, striking component to his work is that he's showing, um, he wants to see his own face. Yeah. And he will tell us all about that right now because yeah. I'm Well, him. hold on one second. So this, so this next video is um, about John Singer Sargent and his influence with the art industrial complex that Kahindi talks about. So the way that artists depict the world around them. My name is Kahindi Wiley. I make paintings, portraits primarily of young African-American men and women. My work in Sargent's intersect with some of the problematics surrounding class. In his day, he was commissioned to make portraits by some of the most celebrated families in the world. I'm a young black man trying to deal with the ways in which colonialism and empire are all in these pictures, but they're fabulous. It's a guilty pleasure, the seduction is there. Sargent is probably one of the best painters I know because he's able to make it look so effortless. You know, that table, the master stroke of the highlight. What's little known is that Sargent would make that master stroke, and if it wasn't just quite right, he'd wipe it off. Let's not doubt that these are high priced luxury goods for wealthy consumers. We look at these amazing sisters in the foreground, but what we also see in the background is a family portrait that points back to the history. And so it's about painting, convincing us about our undeniable place in the world. There's a power relationship here. You're standing in front of this gorgeous woman at this insanely large scale. Where would you be if you were in that room? You're on your knees. All of these paintings were incredibly important social occasions. And so you get the best gowns made, you have your hair done to the nines, the powdered faces and pearls and all of that regalia becomes part of this grand show. These people have been preparing their entire lives for this moment, and here it is. If you look at the eyes, there's a desire to please the artist himself as opposed to correcting for that, Sargent paints the performance. The volume's turned up too high on so much of this stuff to the point where we can almost recognize the absurdity of it. Generally, I enjoy painting the powerless much more than the powerful. My relationship with the art industrial complex is, is a very troubled one. Many of the people who are in my paintings can't afford my paintings. There's a conundrum there. I try to establish a kind of cold neutrality. The cruel indifference of history itself has to be echoed in the enterprise of painting. The strange history in which so many people who are black and brown don't happen to people the great museums throughout the world. My work is not about opining. It's not about looking at the past and longing for that to be something different. I'm interested in using the past in order to break open into the present day. So many people will look at a simple portrait like this and they'll say, you're making so much out of nothing. And I disagree. I think that there is a universe being pointed to here. It's something that you can see if you're interested in looking that way. Yeah, so we're gonna kind of not spend a lot of time on these individual pieces. These are just good examples of him particularly staying close to that art history and referencing those models for precedence. So for, for all of the history that comes with that work, he's now introducing that stranger, that unknown figure into that position of power. Um, he mentions uh, that, it, that he can create and, and these works create um, 
uh, an undeniable place in our world or in this world or in the world that's depicted. So his use of the history here and use of models that he doesn't know off the street in their, their regular garb is really challenging that conversation of what power and prowess and cl class and decadence looks like in um, contemporary America. Um, and how that relates to his, his love for art history. So these are also pieces that he's creating um, at a much larger scale. So this is, this is a good reference. So not only is he breaking or, or taking that form and breaking out of that kind of elite figure, he's also creating larger works than the originals. It creates a larger impact. It gives more power to the individual in the work. Um, and he's able to talk about it at the same scale as these works in the museum because he is physically creating work that is similar or larger than. Well, he's also titling them similar yeah. too, which is, is an interesting um, component mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. This one. Sure. So we get to the more historical ones. Um, so instead of actually just uh, you know, showing people of in power or people, nobles or royalty and that kind of stuff. He's then going into the historical, um, to the stories um, or telling a historical moment. Um, and we're also going to see his first start of uh, the use of horses. And, <laughs> and the horse, um, as it became a very big component in uh, in historical paintings of, uh, you know, of war and of uh, military action and kings and emperors, um, it also is going to be playing a big role in these works. We're going to the next one. If it's just left, I'll be slow. Okay, so this is, <laughs> this is a great example. It's kind of a funny picture. Um, but, you know, Kahindi talks about the power of the artist and the power of the creator here. Um, his philosophy aims to reinterpret the glorified depictions of history, uh, this kind of romantic view of history, particularly depicted through art, right, and writing, but, but we see it literally in art, um, and repopulate it with, with people who weren't typically allowed to exist in those spaces. I just, I love this image because he's literally bringing the power of this history into his studio. It's funny, but he put himself upon that horse and has given himself the challenge to be a creator, to start a new dialogue. Mm -hmm. So focusing on who gets to populate that, that space, that painting, that frame, um, and, and where that painting sits. You know, does it sit in a museum? Does it sit in a gallery? Who's collecting this the work? This looks like it should be like at Katazan, you know? Yes. And and side note, Kehindi, I saw at the Ringling Museum when they first opened their contemporary wing. So the works that I had seen there were not these horse works, but they were the um, the works that we're going to show you next. And uh, that was a huge influence. He, he was in at the Hermitage at 12, but I was at the Ringling at 12. So, <laughs> so he was my influence then, too. Um, go ahead to the next one. So this is the first body of work that he's created that's a one-to-one -one ratio for the most part. Okay, so he's creating these square works on the right. It's a pretty close ratio, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so instead of taking the small 20-inch painting and creating it six feet wide, he's taking these large masterworks and reinterpreting them as another large masterwork. Uh, I talk a lot about the word monumental. Yeah. And the fact that he's creating something that's that's too large to miss. And I think that these works uh, definitely can, can fall in that route there. Yeah. Um, again, these are still strangers in their streetwear that are, that are sitting upon these powerful horses. And he actually did bring horses into his studio for them to take, or to, to do the photo shoot. Yeah. So that they were sitting correctly and yeah. But it was funny, he, he remarked on uh, that the, the horse actually made people smaller. Right. And yet the horse is pretty small in, in this one, in any of them. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, but it was a tool of the painters um, of the time to create these larger than life horses for someone like Napoleon to cross the Alps on. Yeah, Napoleon was not that big. Cool. Yes. Unless yes. that's a pony. <laughs> <laughs> but there's still these powerful um, bases for yeah. these figures too. So I'm gonna transition this just into a little bit of that contemporary dialogue. He's not just referencing these historical works, as he said, to, to relive that history. He's reinterpreting them to give power to contemporary individuals in a space that can be viewed. Painting the powerless. Yes, painting the powerless. So to do that in a public way led to this following public sculpture. Sorry, the slide is just loading slowly. When, I can start this. So Kahindi was asked by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts to create something um, in terms of a public work. So he spent time in Richmond, Virginia and remarks about walking through the city and in the city, in the, the traffic circles in the city, there was a sort of ceremonial appreciation and celebration to these Confederate general statues and Confederate war monuments. And so he describes it as being a, uh, a black man walking through the streets, being kind of overpowered by the 16 to 20 foot tall sculpture of a history that is kind of a looming history, yeah. right? When we talk about civil rights in America. It's a looming, not always talked about history type of thing, or like, you know, if it's talked about, it's talked about one way or the other in such a way that it's very exclusive yes. in, its, in its discussion, yes. absolutely. And so we all know that there is a, a civil rights, I would say unrest at the moment, and there is many, many, many petitions to take some of these uh, Confederate monuments down. The image on the left that this was referenced to did get taken down this year. Yep. But Kehindi is approaching this not in a way to destroy those artworks. He's approaching this to start a dialogue that's just as important to run alongside that work to say, why are we not represented in this way? So, you know, it's taking, taking that approach as a creative, as a, as a maker to decide to make in the same capacity as that historical monument, but put, this is actually the model here is a young artist. So an artist in his own right, he's not a politician, he's not a celebrity. Again, he's just another man on the street, but to put him upon that horse and to see um, those young black and brown men, and you know, and we can extend that to women as we continue this conversation, um, represented in a public space, in a public way. This was unveiled at Times Square and it was there for I think two or three months. So not only the people of New York, um, but all of those international um, visitors were able to see this work. And then it is now um, installed at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, so it, it lives in Richmond now. Yes. Okay. I do like that Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird is in the background in Times Square. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that, that photo is it's pretty interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty pretty genius timing. Right. Okay, so the next step for Candy was to talk about not just a national identity, but an international identity. Uh, he always had his need to understand those Nigerian roots and decided to create what is called uh, the World Stage Series. So for several years, it looks like six years here, he traveled to all of these countries, China, Lagos, Dakar, Brazil, India, Sri Lanka, Israel, France, and Jamaica, Jamaica uh, all together to create works that were again employing models off the street, models that he had met. But looking at that country's history to find references for precedents of what uh, masculinity look like, what portraiture looked like, what power and prowess and presence looked like. So the couple statue on the left was, I, I don't have the, the artist information, but it was from the 18th, 19th century in West Africa, which then he recreated as a painting um, to the right. And he is a young gay black male. Mm -hmm. So to depict an individual and call them a couple, two individuals and call them a couple, is also him understanding his own notions of masculinity, what that looks like, and how to represent that 
in something that can, can also carry the weight of the statue to the left. It's just going a little slow here. Um, so we've got some examples from a few of these. There we go. All right, so these are, um, I'm guessing, where were these ones from? They're both from Lotus and Dakar. Oh, we just put them together as a series. Okay. Um, and you know, what I find really interesting is how he's not only um, taking figures and you know people off the street who he just talked to and made friends with and said, hey, can I photograph you? And, and you know, we'll do this. And, but he's also using um, motifs and, and um, fabric background type looks that are found in that culture. Mm -hmm. um, but if you take these men out of context and you put them into any of his other paintings, they're just, to, you could imagine them to be on the street in, in America. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like how it's that kind of the melding happens throughout these pieces. They're, they're relatable. Mm -hmm. And his, the ability for him to um, paint them with, with power and dignity and to make that connection to the viewer is, um, is, is just, you know, mind blowing that it is continually ha happens over and over again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and he speaks about allowing them wear, to wear their own clothing or their own garb is also a way of him hearkening back to, um, Barclay Hendricks and that idea of kind of the ephemeral fashion and how we choose to represent ourselves yeah. um, and the way in which we interact with each other in that way. So here's a few more examples from that series. Um, the one to the left, I think, is particularly powerful. It's, it reads as a different pattern. It's got this cultural influence um, versus the one on the right. Uh, is from Brazil, so it's a little bit, it feels a little bit more vibrant. Um, but the the duality between these two also talks about Kahindi's need to understand masculinity. And as a portrait artist, he's always reflecting a bit of himself in the work. So you have the muscular arm to the left poised in this manner, and then you have the kind of shrouded individual to the right and how that looks in terms of, um, of, of representations of males. Yeah, Danielle, I wonder, why has he only been painting men? <laughs> <laughs> so Kahindi uh, talks a lot about painting what you know and as a man he doesn't know a woman he, he is not a woman he doesn't feel comfortable painting a woman until later in life so these depictions of these men um, and even groups of men that idea of twinning and doubling and tripling um, relates to his own understanding of himself and how to create that visual language his own voice as an artist before he branches out beyond that. Right, and it's his mother that is actually the kind of the key component to um, that that idea of how he finally becomes comfortable to paint women, the female, um, form. The female form. And then this one here is actually kind of a transition place. This is um, this a uh, person who is of both sexes. Um, who was in transition, um, and it was part of the the World Series, mm -hmm. so World Stage, World Stage. Thank you. Uh, so stage. this was this is a good example of the transition between understanding himself and understanding identity and gender roles in portraiture. Mm -hmm. Oops, and then we get to there is a series that he has. Um, seems to be, it, it, this made, they made into a documentary, which you can actually find at the, the public library through um, Hoopla, which is through the virtual portal. Um, you'll be able to download it and watch this uh, documentary if you'd like. It's called An Economy of Grace. Um, this is just a segment and talking about the show. Oops. Come on. An Economy of Grace is a body of work that starts out by street casting, finding young women in New York City and asking them to come into the studio and be fitted for couture one-of-a-kind gowns. I actually enlisted Givenchy, which is one of the premier fashion houses in the world, to create 
works that responded to them as individuals. Ricardo Tichy, the fashion director of Givenchy, had a very uh, unique understanding of this proposition. In fact, we walked through the Louvre together and chose specific moments within the history of fashion and portraiture to react to. And so in choosing that sort of very limited set of palettes and, and, and terms, he then responded to the women. And I sort of paired one to the next. I think what, what happens there is we're used to seeing a Kehinde Wiley painting in urban gear. And I wanted to, ch to sort of flip the script. I wanted to flip the script in terms of the expectation of a type of fetishized ur urban look. But I also wanted to uh, look at um, how we fetishize couture, how we think about this kind of high priced luxury good, which I consider paintings to be as, as, as exactly what it is. So if you're naming the terms historically, if you're naming the terms performatively, uh, it makes for a much more interesting experience as an artist and, and as a thinker. The gowns actually, we, we saved so that they can go and be auctioned off. The idea there was, was that they would have much more power as cash that would go towards organizations that serve the underprivileged communities from which the women came. Well, we're gonna show a few images from the show so you get a little more of a glimpse at them. So Elizabeth and I were talking about these kind of, um, the, the role in which women played in art history, but also are represented today. Um, and the in the backgrounds that Kehinde is using here. So he breaks away from just a decorative motif and includes foliage, right? This idea of life and, and women, um, and, and like woman as nature, woman as mother. Yes. Mother nature. It's very, um, it's fertile. Mm -hmm, fertile, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so some of these depictions of the overwhelming floral aspects next to this poised women, you know, she's not lying nude, She's she is, um, poised and, and has a presence. I think, I think talk about his relationship with, with his mom too um, and, and how he sees her as the... They're very um, respectful. They're mm -hmm. very powerful. And they're, um, you know, they, they have that, that pull again and that dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they, again, they draw you in. Um, there was one quote that he used, there's like it called the sugar appeal um kind of draws you in uh because they are so you know, bright and shiny i guess i don't know They're yeah in the same way that sergeant used those highlights on pearls yes. or the translucent lace um through these little moments of decadence that you find uh and that keep you keep you yes. viewing i mean the the way that one of the leaves overlaps the edge of her dress and it just kind of curls and holds there and it just draws your eye back up to her shoulder. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. So I'm going to go on to the next one, hopefully. We're getting there. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay. okay. Can I take it? Yeah. All right. So let's let's just wrap it all back up to uh, that idea of the power held within the portrait. So we heard Kehinde mention that he prefers to paint the powerless rather than the powerful. However, he was commissioned to do the portrait on the left for former President Barack Obama for mm -hmm. the National Portrait Gallery. We purposely did not put any of his commissioned work in because mm -hmm. he has been commissioned by many um, different artists, uh, be it Michael Jackson, um, some many the music artists yeah. in the hip hop industry. Um, and, and now the presidential portrait. Right. So, so we have this juxtaposition here. Um, the one to the right is from the series we were just looking at, The Economy of Grace, where this figure is turned away, um, almost to say you're not invited to this conversation, right? The female is, is turned away. Um, she still embodies all of that decadence and that hair is indicative of his work from Yale. That was the kind of presence of blackness and how that's identified in our culture. Um, versus, so the power is 
literally given to the female on the right and she's not giving it back to us, right? There's, there's no dialogue here. That is just a figure represented in its, in all of its presence. Very definitely. I keep seeing this one as like, you know, Madam X from John Singer Sargent mm -hmm. with the whole, you know, she's not even making eye contact. Right. But she's there. She's, but she's beyond. Yes. So now how do you flip that when you paint someone as well known as President Barack Obama? Who holds that place of power, the most powerful person in the nation. Right. Yeah. And um, Obama specifically said he wanted to be represented as himself rather than the president. So this work to the left, if we just look at its composition and that power held within a painting, he is sit seated, he is leaned forward, his arms are crossed, he's looking directly at the viewer. He is well lit, but he does not necessarily have halo lighting, which makes him glow and become weightless. He is really quite approachable in this image. Um, and that's and that's how he wanted to be represented and how Kahindi felt he should be represented as an individual um, that we can all relate to. I also just want to mention that the filigree in the background of this portrait talks about all of the the nations that uh, he had done political work with. Um, there are flowers from Hawaii. There are flowers from Kenya. Um, so it talks about the man as a whole and how he got to this point in his life, rather than that celebrityism of, of presidency. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the next picture that we're going to be eventually getting to, um, as soon as it loads, um, will is actually the the revealing of the two president, the presidential portrait and the first lady's portrait, which were notably done both by African American artists. Yes. So on the far left here, you have Kahindi and the portrait with Obama and then Michelle. And then on the far right, you have Amy Sharon, who is also a contemporary painter, um, newer in her career yes. than Kahindi at this moment in time. Um, but th these, these are two influential individuals who are looking at contemporary art and the way in which they are represented and they chose these artists. They chose these artists to represent them. So you've got these, you know, upcoming or international art stars who are talking about the representation of, of, of uh, black men and women in artwork. And, and these two, we just kind of wanted to sum it up with that as, right. as this, is, this has become a, a discussion beyond the museum. Beyond well, and it's the also artwork. kind of interesting that it's also a discussion between male and female. Mm -hmm. um, Amy paints, predominantly women mm -hmm. and Hindi are predominantly men. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've got, you know, a whole level of, of different things to, to discuss yes. on that one. But it's, it brought, um, it was actually, you know, these two portraits, once they went into the portrait gallery, brought in, I think it was, it was a huge influx of visitors to the portrait gallery that they were not expecting and it was you know it was great mm -hmm. notoriety for the portrait gallery for museums and for the artists themselves too mm -hmm. all right so um maybe that'll be the next one yes you can say I'm looking so i just want to um before we open it up for question and answer i just want to say that as mentioned in the beginning kahindi has a plethora of work and we only touched on two and a half series of his work. Um, so a lot of what we were trying to get at was this idea of identity, both on an individual, national, international um, scale, and how he's representing what black and brown bodies look like when powerful within a painting in a museum, like scale, at a museum scale. Um, so yeah, so and a lot of the times, some of it, or for a while, originally he was his pictures were his paintings were shown with the contemporary one or the, with the historical one next to him. Um, now it's it's transitioned to a little teeny tiny picture of the historical one, and his big work takes precedent takes because precedent. his name is out there now. Yeah. So um, I just want you guys to know um, we're gonna have the discussion next, but I want to tell you what the next salon is going to be. On July 31st, it's the Color Feel Artists. Um, this is an image by Frank Stella. So um, Judy, Justin, and I will be presenting it. 
Uh, and I go to the next one, slide, which is the Art Center thing, saying um, if you could please remember to donate to the Art Center. We thank everyone for coming. And let's discuss Kehinde. And if you could turn your videos on and we can have a nice discussion here, because um, I, here, you do that. Um, you know, so what I want to do is I would like to have a discussion. This is an uncomfortable discussion for me. Um, as, a, as a white person, as a white woman, but I want to have a discussion. And I think that we need to have a discussion um, that's just candid, eye-opening, and, and fresh for everyone. So if you want to unmute your mics, um, I would love to hear everyone's views on, on what we have presented today and how you feel about the artwork. If you think that we've, if, how you feel, yeah, yeah, about the artwork pretty much. All right. Well, I'd like to, can I start it, Start off? Yes, Patricia, um, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to say, I, I, I came in late. I'm sorry, I was doing some errands and I completely lost track of time. Um, but um, I just, I think, I find the artwork breathtakingly beautiful. I think just it's just gorgeous. Um, but I was struck by one thing that he said in one of those videos that most of his, the subjects of his artwork can't afford to buy any of his paintings. Yeah. And I find that so deeply sad that I was weeping when, when he was saying that. And I was glad that I was muted because you would have been um, <laughs> treated to my sobs <laughs> in the, in the um, salon. I'm sorry about that. No. But um, I just find that so sad that um, a whole segment of our society can't be uh, can't own such beautiful works of art, and um, I'm wondering if he has prints that people could afford to buy, or I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure he has small small prints uh, available through the museums for some of his larger works. But you're right, Patricia, it starts this conversation of not only who can afford the work, but who is within the work, right? And, and yeah. why they're within that work. So the wall between mm -hmm. the segments of our society is. Yeah. Yeah. Very sad. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, it's one of those like, okay, so when, you know, if you have, you're lucky enough to get to go to Art Basel or even a gallery, you go in and you know, a lot of the times the conversations, even here, the conversation is, you know, how much is the artwork? Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, the artwork is that reason because the artist needs to be able to, you know, eat and have food, but it's not accessible to everyone. And how do you make that happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that actually goes to a farther reaching problem of, you know, of, of economic, you know, well, I think issues. I think, and I think that the museum is meant to fill that gap, right? Mm -hmm. The museum is here to display the masterworks that we can't afford at home or can't display at home, but that you can experience them. So it's the idea of public art and, and what a museum should function as, um, and they do function as that. But as Kahindi mentions, there's not enough representations of people who look like him within those historical works because they weren't taken into consideration in the same way that some of these others were. I mean, half the time so, there's not enough consideration of even women. Yeah. Or women artists. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of, you know, as much as we, we hope that the art world is, is more fair, it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's unbalanced, just as everything else is. But that's yeah, and, and they talk. And of course, this is this is um, talks of kind of contemporary politics. But that idea of a um, uh, systemic issue, right? I've been sitting on a lot of these Zoom calls with museums and how to approach a systemic issue within the museum and who's funding the works, who's deciding the works that are on view. Um, and I think it it takes you know, a, just a reinterpretation and, and, yeah. and direct analysis of, of some of that. But the systemic issue also goes to, well, the virtual 
ones. Not everyone has an internet connection either. Yeah. So, but going back to uh, Kehinde's work, he he's working predominantly with again the male form, mm -hmm. um, and that scale. I mean, what do you guys think about the the, the sheer scale of his work? Um, yes, Liz. Um, last year, the 30 art American artists show showed in Tucson. It's Riddell family out of Miami. It was all black artists, and it was shocking. Um, the president's uh, portrait was there, as, as well as another portrait of uh, somebody on a horse that was overpowering. Uh, some of the work was upsetting to look at. Uh, one of the works by Nick Cave, I loved. But I have a new respect for um, his work. For Nick Cave's or for Kehinde's? Well, Nick, Nick Cave was one of the 30 artists that was shown along with Kehinde, Wiley's Kehinde. work, yeah. Kehinde. Yeah. <laughs> whatever his name is. But it was impressive and it gave me a new uh, perspective because where I live now, it's Hispanic influence, mm -hmm. not a black influence. Mm -hmm. And that's where the argument comes in and where the, the discretion comes in. Mm -hmm. So it was a very new for me and I loved it. I love his work. I couldn't do it, but I love to look at it. Yes. Yeah, I, it always makes a it's, it's its own statement. It stands on its own. Mm -hmm. I mean, not many artists can can claim that. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he Kahindi's also gotten to the point where he's an international art star at the moment. So he has a yeah. studio in Beijing, a studio in LA, a studio in New York. Oh. So he has an entire team of artists who are helping him make these works at the moment. Uh, it was actually kind of rare to find a photo of him painting in the studio. <laughs> uh, there's, I saw a couple of interviews from when he was just starting out in the early 2000s that were like local public radio, public news of him talking in a studio. And those felt really uh, kind of authentic. But now he's become this huge star that's, that starts all of the work, but also has those hands helping, just like all the old masters did too. So he has whole workshops. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes more sense and makes me not feel as guilty for not having as much work. Or eating as much, yeah. Since he's the same age as me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Was there anyone who didn't know his work at all? Oh, go ahead, Judy. You can just unmute yourself. Yep. Unmute. Mute, yeah. mute, mute. I'm sorry. I was coughing. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to say two things. Um, one, I was so incredibly blown away by the two portraits that yeah. because they're so different, Michelle and Obama. Yeah. And I mean, I fell in love with his work when I first saw it. I know I knew nothing about him. It was a great presentation. Thanks. Um, but you know, you can look at his work. Yes, it has all this backstory, but you can look at it and appreciate it. Yeah. Just for what it is. And I was looking at some of them, and I had this scent. You you mentioned uh, who was the fabric guy? Morris. Uh, William yeah. Morris. Yes. Uh, William Morris. Um, if the paintings that he had these tendrils going in front of the figure, yeah, they felt very woven because the background and the foreground and the subject all blended together. And it was very organic. Yeah, we were and finding as we were looking through them, the there was some discrepancy. So, like when the tendrils form around the figure, the figures were represented or were um, based off a painting. And then when they were sculptures, they didn't always have that that tendril that wrapped around them. That's yeah. only from looking at a teeny bit of his work. So. <laughs> Well, I felt better knowing that he doesn't do it all. So, because, you know, and that, that was the other thing I wanted to say. He did a collaboration with Givenchy, and I thought, you know, somebody at his level, two things. Mm -hmm. Gay guys know guys. They know people. 
And I mean, I've had a number of gay friends who just, they know all these incredible people because they do. And to have that collaboration, and it's a, a, it took him to a level where he could have a co collaboration like that. And there are other people who, when they rise to fame and funny, money and fortune and whatever, they have a whole new access of people and experiences. Yeah. And it was wonderful. I love that part of it. Okay. So. so what about the, uh, this notion of, of starting a new conversation in the museum or in history in the way that we're represented in a contemporary way? Um, I'm not going to call you out, but I'm definitely calling you out, uh, Pahala and Jim, because you guys are part of ASALA, which is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And, you know, we, we collaborate with you guys every year, but to the best of my knowledge, your mission is to give a voice to African American artists of all kinds, right? Writers, scientists, politicians, just to cement that place in history. So. I, I'm just kind of interested in your reaction to his work in that way that he's presenting it in this context. Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess what I see in his work in, in some West African traditions is the notion of what's called Sankofa, which means reaching back in the past to help you guide you into the future. And so I see him reaching back to, to sort of garner the, the uh, techniques that come out of these um, major European artists sort of adapting those to sort of present himself in the present. But if you look at the images of the young black men, they're all very powerful and, and uh, very affirming. And I think he's suggesting that that's the future that he wants to create by sort of reconfiguring the past and, and making us more aware of what's going on in the present. Yeah, I like that a lot too. He, I, I remember him saying something about, at, you know, particularly about that Confederate statue that he was referencing and his remake of that and, uh, and that power that comes with a, a monument in a public space. And he talks about as individuals, as citizens of this nation, we should do better and we need to do better yeah. to represent everyone, right? All, all of these individuals who are making, I mean, he's, an international art star at the moment too. So it's not just his hometown that he's become become something. He's starting a conversation globally too. So I think that's, yeah. Let me give you my two cents. This is Paul. Uh, mm -hmm. Just uh, again, referencing the power of his work is just unreal. Uh, and especially when you see it in person, the, the magnitude, the size of the yeah. work in itself. And, and his women, I found, you know, even though most of his work right now are men, but the, the women, you know, the Economy of Grace series and the, the just staring into the faces of those women that he's painting. You talked about the singer Sergeant. He is just as powerful in terms of uh, 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 trying to get the feeling that this woman is trying to tell you just with her look, either turning away saying, get away, you know, don't come at me or just staring at me and saying like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, you can feel, you can feel what she's trying to say to you. You know, and then you go back to the statue, jumping there quickly to the uh, statue of the rumors of war. I was fortunate enough to be in Times Square and see it in person. You know, one of the big takeaways from that, everybody, they, you know, all the folks on the street were talking about, did you see he's wearing Nike shoes? <laughs> <laughs> It was obvious he made it clear that you up close see if those were Nikes that this young man was wearing on that horse, just bringing it into the 20th, 21st century and the type of gear that the current modern day warrior wears, you know, when we go into battle, you know. So I just thought that was great. Uh, I, I was there, I was at a distance, didn't get up close when he was unveiling that, but you know, it was interesting just being around, seeing people react to that. It was fun. Yeah, I like that you called uh, like the the Nikes the armor because because that's what yeah. it is. You know that idea of finding models on the street who are presenting themselves in this way where they're protected, yeah. empowered. Uh, that garb is really that armor that that we walk in every the single day. Clothing becomes armor, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, especially when you I mean, you take that that idea. So the the horseback ones too, mm -hmm. where they're you know they're ready for war. And they're, they've got that, you know, they're 
wearing what they would have worn just as they came off the yeah, street. Yeah, the white t-shirts. Right out of tops. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but that's their, that's their battle armor. That's right. And that, you know, Nike has a history, his, Nike has a history too, yeah. with their strong support of Colin Kaepernick. You know, his themes uh, current today in terms of a the current struggle that's going on in terms of human rights and dignity. So, you know, he was interesting how he's working all of that uh, in, into it. Uh, let me uh, also apologize, making a quick apology. My wife is mad at me. Some of you know that that's really a phony background behind us. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so you're not going to see my dirty beds. Right? That's, my, that's my New York City penthouse we're looking at. Also, uh, let me give a shout out. You actually have two guests on this from Seattle, Washington, I see. And I noticed uh, Ms. Maisha Barnett and uh, Brenda Newman. So uh, you got folks international show today. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, we can't see them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but they can be unmuted if they would like to join the conversation. All right. I saw I saw the hippies piece at Art Basel two years yeah. ago. It yeah. was just massive, yeah. just overwhelming you. Yes. All of his pieces at Art Basel are so huge and just so powerful, and they draw a big crowd of people taking pictures with their cell phone because it's just. It's yeah, they, they smartly always put them on like an end of an aisle. So, like, yeah, they put them on the aisle, on yeah. into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what do they go for? How much do they sell for? Oh, I don't know that answer. They, they don't put prices at Art Basel. Yeah, yeah. There were no prices on any. You have to ask. You can't afford it. That's basically what it is. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think that also, so I, I was talking a lot about working at the scale of a museum, right? So he's not creating salon style works that are 10 inches that yeah. can get lost among things. And this idea of creating something that is a spectacle, harkening back to John Singer Sargent's relation of that industrial complex and what a spectacle is. Uh, I think it's just really great that he's translating the same conversation of these European colonial large-scale works yeah. into contemporary America and, 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 well, internationally, contemporary art culture and art general. Well, yeah. it, and this also, it was interesting, in a lot of the articles, it looked like, you know, he was commissioned to make a number of these bodies of work that are in, in series. Mm -hmm. um, for, by museums. Mm -hmm. So in, he's being commissioned directly by museums for, for shows. And does that mean that they become traveling shows that the museum puts down the money for or something like that? But that is, that is an, a different dynamic than most artists have the, uh, the luxury of doing. Of yeah. doing. Yeah. So I, I do want to mention too, we, we kind of hinted at that he has more bodies of work. He has an incredible amount of religious paintings or iconography, um, both at a very small kind of gilded cur cabinet of curiosity scale and also at an incredible 40 foot scale. Yeah, the, the Columbus Museum of Art in Columbus, mm -hmm. Ohio actually commissioned that, that piece. So stained glass, small like reliquary prayer, um, triptych type pieces mm -hmm. and uh and then some bigger pieces yeah it was i, I didn't get to see it because i wasn't there yet but you know <laughs> and then and then out, outside of that he also has a body of work that is directly related to hip-hop culture and hip-hop fashion yes so a young artist who is is working in all of these avenues um, but using that historical reference within all of them to create uh, this dialogue kind of cross culturally. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any more questions or thoughts? So, why do you think that he uh, outer nature? to be in relationship to uh, these powerful figures? Uh, Does he talk about the patterned nature? Of the backgrounds? patterns that he has behind and in front of his the patterns that he uses as his backgrounds and then come to the foreground what does he say about why he, he uses those, those particular um, patterns or why he uses patterns I understand it's his vernacular 
but I wondered why he chose that. There are um, many ways to treat backgrounds. Right, yes. I don't have an answer as to why he started uh, using the background, but he was looking at it as simply a backdrop, something that doesn't distract from the figure. And then eventually with the World Stage Series, those motifs were influenced by the countries. So I don't know why he started. Yeah. Well, if you um, also I, look at you know, how he picked um, Martha Stewart color. color of the year type of thing, so you have that color and those particular choices of color. Mm -hmm. um, and then he goes to particular motifs that lend themselves to very flattening for wallpaper and that kind of stuff, but also portray power. And um, I mean, the, the original, the early influences were Rococo, which means over the top gilded frames, you know, as many little gigas, but you still got that that richness to it yeah um yeah. and then yeah. so when when he went to nigeria at 20 when he was exploring his um african roots he talked a lot about meeting a textile designer while he was there and that's the individual who created all of his suits since then yeah. um and has also posed for a couple of paintings so i think when he was understanding where his father came from he was heavily influenced by those patterns of the textiles yes yeah. I think what I what I think it is is the the background textures relate to the time period that he's you know using to reference his so it, it may be textiles that were popular at that time um, that he's using for those backgrounds just like he used the um, you know the Martha Stewart that's contemporary but when you go back to you know wherever he gets his references from. They might have been those with the actual textiles that were popular at that time, and, and maybe that's what his yeah. why he incorporated certain it's ones. Interesting to take a deep dive into more of a deep dive into his painting. Yeah, Sorry. I think they're very deep, and you know, just guessing on the surface. Well, you said I, that um, in Obama's painting, there were reference the flowers yeah. were references. The foliage, the foliage. Yeah, yeah. Well, the foliage yeah. was reference different places. So. It's another tool to to give information to the viewer as to the story of the painting. Right, it kind of time stamps it, you know, just, Maybe he's not he's using he's those old done. fabrics with new things. The only thing that I would t say to contest that would be that Obama's is a portrait that is a commissioned piece. Yeah. It's a commissioned piece for a specific person that he knows the history and background of, and he's trying to represent that person and other people know that person. So the, um, the Versus him just selecting a background that might or might not relate to the individual who right. pulls off I mean, who knows, he yeah. may have a swatch book at, at the studio and have the, um, the, the person who's posing for him pick through and pick a, a, a motif they like, who knows? Mm -hmm. um, but it is an interesting idea as to where he does um, find his uh, sources for his background because the, he's very explicit explaining the sources for his figures. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We'll call him up and ask him, Elizabeth. <laughs> we'll do that. Can we get him down here as a guest speaker? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just have another book club. And yeah. <laughs> I did, I did want to mention, so we shared this on Facebook and an individual who follows the art center shared it and also included that we were having a solo exhibition of Candy Wally's work and he was going to be here for this discussion. And I said, oh, well, that's news for me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I quickly corrected that. But how great would that be? <laughs> also. We need bigger walls. <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I want to just throw, throw a thought out because we live in a an area. Liz alluded to it um, out in out west. You have the Hispanic and the Native American cultures that are the quote na black people of the area and are not treated with equal and uh, equally. And but our this is a very white community. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring people of other c colors 
I'm not being politically correct, but you know what I mean, um, into what we're doing here. Yeah. You know, how many times do you see someone that's skin is different than this? Not many. And, and that is why the Art Center, one of the reasons why the Art Center is here. Um, we partner with Asala and uh, Michelle Redwine's, uh, who is it? It's a, yeah. And <laughs> there's so uh, many, many, and many artists who are outside of the area. Um, and that, that, because we want to be able to promote artwork from all, um, all, yeah, diaspora. Yes, thank you. All diasporas. Yeah, Judy, I think that's a great comment and question and start of a discussion. Yeah. And I think that's uh, my part as, as an ally and as an artist and mm -hmm. as an appreciator of the work is to offer something like this, offer this as a forum, offer this as a discussion, yep. and do my best to also bring that information of, from that artist to light. Uh, and so I, I think that's, that is the question, that is the question of the times, right? Um, 5.30. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and and what, one other thing is people I've spoken to of other colors, variegated, variegated colors, a lot of them do not feel comfortable coming into a situation that we are very comfortable in. Right. So. Yeah, did you watch that studio visit I did with Vitus, Shell, Judy? No, okay. I haven't done that yet. I was doing, uh, I, I still am, they're just not every single week, uh, just a little video interview with um, some artists that we had either upcoming or previously uh, included in our solo exhibits. So. I kind of encourage all of you to take a look at the one. It's recorded. It's on the Explore tab where this, this uh, discussion group also is. And he is a contemporary artist, uh, a lot of collage and painting based out of Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, and his, his kind of philosophy as an artist is how to show the youth in his own community that they can be represented in these spaces. Wow. So that, it's a pretty good conversation he and I had. Um, so, so if you're interested more about that, that was What's true. his name? Vitus What's Shell. V-I-T-U-S. Shell. Yeah. Yeah. I'll text you the link. Okay. Danielle. Danielle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me give a shout out to uh, Art Center, Sarasota for your reaching out to different artist communities of color, uh, the black community, the Latino community. Uh, so that's, you know, again, reaching out to you, uh, Elizabeth, Danielle, Lisa, for the work you're doing. The uh, big thing you do is you host with Asala, you mentioned it, the annual Black Muse exhibition. Yeah. For the during the month of February, and I think we're planning this February, February 2021. Mm -hmm. I think we'll be mostly clear with social distancing. Really? But, uh, I know that's being led this year by Michelle Redwine and Michelle Parchmont. Yes. Two Michelles duo. Uh, that's an Asala, but this year Asala is collaborating with kind of a new group that's on the scene called the Suncoast Black arts collaborative sbac yes. so uh, there's a lot of new ideas intending to bring uh, art and more and different communities involved in the sarasota arts community than in the past so Great. keep your eye out for that judy i think we're going Great. to uh, thank it's thank wonderful you. and we're excited about it too <laughs> I think, uh, but Paul, I think that that is also kind of reigning true across the U.S. Um, I've yeah. seen a lot of new organizations uh, for individuals of every gender, every background, um, kind of collaborating together to, to gain notoriety for their individuals. So Sounds thank good. you for doing that. Yeah. Thank you. I know I, this whole, Thanks. even though that we've had all this craziness, it's the, the networking and the, um, the positivity that has come from the museums and the art community has been overwhelmingly wonderful. So everyone keep it up, keep supporting the arts and we love the arts and 
uh, and be well, be safe, and take care. Thank you so much for participating in today's uh, discussion for Art Salon. And take care, be safe.